today we have with us Dr. Jean Dodds. She's a world-renowned vaccine research scientist who lectures worldwide on clinical pathology and hematology, blood banking, immunology, endocrinology, nutrition, and holistic medicine. She's also the founder of Hemopet, a nonprofit animal bank in Southern California, and has a book out, The Canine Thyroid Epidemic, Answers You Need to Know for Your Dog. Dr. Dodds will be talking about hypothyroidism in dogs. So welcome, Dr. Dodd. Hello. I would like to start off by asking, why has hypothyroidism in dogs become such an epidemic, and what are the likely causes of this disease? Well, you know, over the years, as we've line-bred and inbred purebred dogs, and with the advent of the designer breeds where we've done hybrid breeding, um, as well as the mixed breeds that usually have one or two of these breeds within their background, um, we've been fine until the environment continually became changed. We've depleted the ozone layer. We have climate warming. We have um, many drugs that are now being used routinely to prevent things, and everybody thinks, oh, well, it would be great to prevent this, that, and the other. And so instead of thinking of alternative approaches, we used uh, pharmacological intervention. Then we have vaccines, 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 and vaccines. And so you add all of that stuff, and then into the mix you put the key thing, which is nutrition. And so if nutrition isn't balanced properly and healthy, and we're only using um, some of the commercial pet foods, which are good, and some of them which are not so good, depending on the particular needs of a pet, the age, the breed, whether they can tolerate grains, etc. cetera, um, now we have an epidemic. And what's it, what is it doing? It's targeting those tissues that control body metabolism. In other words, the pituitary thyroid axis. Okay. So at what age do most of the symptoms start showing and what should the owners be looking for? Well, you know, that's another difficult thing because classically we're taught to look for a fat, lazy dog with bad skin who doesn't like the cold. Well, if you're living in a hot climate, that's not so easy to find. But in fact, those classical signs don't show up until at least 70% of the animal's thyroid gland has been damaged. So we're missing the entire period from when it starts until it gets to that end stage. And so the challenge for us is to recognize the symptoms very, very early. And they usually start after puberty, uh, occasionally before that, but typically 9 to 14 months of age is when the uh, changes would start. And sometimes all you see is a behavioral change. The animal suddenly not the sociable, cuddly, um, calm animal it used to be. It starts to do some weird things. And f at first the owner thinks, I don't, I don't believe it. This is just a random event. And then they start seeing weird things more often with other animals in the home or other people in the home and then when people start visiting. And so that's the clue that something's not right. Now it could be other things. It doesn't have to be thyroid disease. It could be a urinary tract infection or bad ears or, or upset tummy or, you know, gas in the gut that makes them feel growly owly like we would but often it's the start of the process of thyroid dysfunction okay um so does hypothyroidism often what percent would you say starts at the age that you mentioned can it also start later in life it can start later in life when the animal has a particular stress. In other words, an animal can be very healthy until midlife, mm -hmm. and then some stress event occurs, and it wipes out um, the function of metabolism that's sort of in a compensatory state. Much like kidney disease can, with aging can be fine um, until an animal's 10 or 12, and all of a sudden they're drinking a little more water, yes, to flush out the kidneys, and then all of a sudden they decompensate. But we have to remember that Ten years ago, the typical age of hypothyroidism was two to six years of age. Mm -hmm. Typically now, it's one and a half to three years of age. So the environment has definitely caused these diseases to show up earlier. Hmm. Okay. Um, so even though your dog may not show any symptoms of hypothyroidism, would you recommend to start testing your dog at a certain age as part of your blood testing, yearly blood testing, annual testing? The annual wellness exam is extremely important, as it is for ourselves, and I know we often don't do that as often as we should, but remember, a year is a long time in a pet's lifespan, and so we should start around puberty with a healthy animal, uh, you know, maybe a year of age, and do annual blood testing, and that should include a complete thyroid panel, not just a T4, like many veterinarians are taught by laboratories to do the what we call the CBC, Complete Blood Count, Super Chem, Serum Chemistries, T4, and your analysis. Well, that's just not good enough. 
And so they produce uh, special profiles that are less expensive to do this as a wellness screen. And you'll miss so many thyroid cases if you just measure a total T4. You won't diagnose any of the heritable forms of thyroid disease that are so prevalent in many breeds. It won't be seen that way. And sometimes the animal's getting to the point where it's so asocial it's going to be put to sleep. And it's three years old and it's been um, unusual for, for, for a year and a half and nobody's done the right testing. We've had animals that have come within a hair breadth of being put to sleep for behavioral issues when they had thyroiditis and they could have been treated. Hmm. So from my understanding, there are two types of hypothyroidism. You have a primary and a secondary. What is the difference between these two? Well, <laughs> there's actually more than two types. In primary thyroid disease, it means that the thyroid gland is the target of the problem. And so the problem is typically 90% of the time associated with this genetic defect, um, autoimmune thyroiditis. And the other 10% is what we call idiopathic, meaning idiot pathology. We don't know why. <laughs> um, atrophy of the thyroid gland. We don't really understand that. So those would be the primary thyroid diseases. And they're all familial. They run in families. And in the thyroiditis case, they're heritable. Secondary thyroid disease is when you have some other condition that's suppressing the thyroid gland, like a non-thyroidal illness. And what it's going to suppress is basically your total T4, like we talked about. It usually has very little effect on the free, unbound T4, and it does not affect thyroid autoantibodies. And so secondary hypothyroidism, when you have liver disease, gut disease, skin disease, kidney disease, that is not caused by a thyroid problem, but looks like it because of incomplete testing. Okay. So if you want to test your dog for hypothyroidism, what tests should you do to make a correct diagnosis or a correct diagnosis can be made? Yes. You need to have a full thyroid antibody profile, which means a total T4, it's free, biologically unbound fraction, a total T3, the free T3, the unbound fraction of T3, and at least a thyroglobulin autoantibody, which is the marker for autoimmune thyroid disease. There are other tests that can be run, but those are the critical ones. And so why, why is it necessary to conduct all of these tests? It's necessary to do all of them to rule in or rule out a thyroid problem, and you do it um, you know, annually with your wellness exam, and especially in breeds at high risk for thyroid disease or in families where we already know another family member is affected. So siblings, uh, half-siblings, parents, grandparents, etc. And also, um, if the animal is on therapy, let's say it was diagnosed as hypothyroid correctly and it was put on the appropriate dose of therapy, when you're doing subsequent follow-ups, you may not have to do the whole profile each time. It depends on the case, the individual case. And if there was a thyroid autoantibody elevation initially, it has to be measured each time you redo it um, to check that it's not starting up again, that it's being under control. Okay. So if we're looking into the tests, what do the results mean, normal versus abnormal? <laughs> I know it's a broad set of the nor Well, first of all, let's just, just make a comment here. We are the only veterinary diagnostic lab in the world that actually interprets results based on the age and the breed or breed type and the activity level, couch potato versus Iditarod racer of the dog. Uh, same thing with cats. Nobody else is doing that. And so when a veterinarian gets a printout from a commercial uh, or un even university reference lab, it's all the same. All dogs are considered to be the same. And they're not the same if they're young. They're not the same if they're old. Young animals should have more activity. Old animals should have less because they're not running around and jumping around as much. And then certain breeds are quite different. Toy breeds are more active than giant breeds. Sighthounds, as a rule, all sighthounds have low levels of thyroid uh, relative to other breed types. And so with all the rescued greyhounds in the world that are being adopted, many veterinarians may still, or some veterinarians, may still not know this. And so they do a test on a greyhound, typically a T4. It's going to be low. They put them on a humongous dose of thyroid, which is way too high for a sighthound and causes all kinds of secondary issues.